Welcome back to another episode of Professor and the Idiot. I'm Nick Wolfinger. And I am Dalton Whitehead. Thank you for sticking with us through all these weeks. Yeah, I did notice that the, the episode with Sean Cup had uh, over 130 views on YouTube. That's great. I don't know if it was the title and the name that came up in more searches or not, or people are just more interested in that episode, but I appreciate you guys for listening. Uh, yes, thank you. And on the Facebook page, you'll notice the episode with the men's rights activist Kursat last week. Uh, one of our listeners, Bill Phillips, was really enthusiastic about Kursat's project. Oh, I, I didn't catch that. That's oh, yeah. Good. Look at the Facebook page. And there's been some engagement on Twitter when uh, I tweeted a link about the episode. So that one. I, I did see that. Yeah. I, I have been following that. So I think it's good. I think uh, having guests on, maybe not every single time, but having guests is good. We have the freedom because we have no corporate masters. <laughs> when it comes to podcasting, we're libertarians. <laughs> What's on your mind, Dalton? A bunch of things. Uh, this episode, I kind of want to just, just talk, you know, just kind of bounce around about subjects. No specific subject for the whole episode, but... I think uh, <laughs> the number one thing people have been talking about lately is Jesse Smollett. I'd love to hear. <laughs> oh, I, if you're tired of it, we don't have to no, talk about it. No, I haven't talked about it or read about it too much. A couple of thoughts. This is awful for a number of reasons. Yeah, it's just sad. <laughs> yeah, it's sad that he would think to... So if you're not following the story, Jesse Smollett is an actor on a TV show, and he is African-American, and he's gay, and he feared that he was going to be written out of the TV show in future seasons. So based on all the evidence we have now, he staged a hate crime hoax. He got a couple guys to... I don't know. I don't know all the details. But at first, it looked like he was a victim of a hate crime. They tied a noose around his neck, and most recently, the police have charged Jesse Smollett with faking a hate crime. Yeah, was it uh, falsifying a police report? Was that what it was? The charge? I believe so. It's a it's a felony. What he's been charged with? Now, the I think the number one question that came about when the the truth came out, for the most part. Does he deserve to go to jail? I think he's a, he's a sick man. Mentally. He's yeah, mentally. Not well. He's disturbed. To think that this would somehow be good for his career. So, I mean, nobody. he wasn't talked about until now. I mean, the, I listen to – I subscribe to Ben Shapiro's podcast, but I – basically never listen unless he has a guest on that I'm somewhat interested in. And I saw that he was talking about this. So I was like, all right, I'll tune in. But, I, you know, I'm not, like, the biggest fan of Ben Shapiro. I think he thinks he's smarter than he really is. <laughs> not that I'm very smart, but he's just got that smugness about him. And he was – I think he made, he made a good point about this of, so what happens if the Chicago police identified – two white guys walking around at the same time and area, was this guy going to go through and, say, and falsely accuse people and get them sentenced to jail or prison for this? That would have been terrible. Yeah. The Chicago police did question a couple of guys and then release them without charging them. That would be terrible. and that would, But that's not what happened. I'd like to see him avoid jail time, but get probation, a fine, community service, and court-mandated therapy. Yeah, because with this crime, there wasn't really a victim. Yes, that's so true. So it's for me to uh, be on board with locking somebody in a cage for a victimless crime. I have a hard time with that. I understand. But, man, this is... <laughs> It's just a crazy scenario, I, especially his uh, motivation for it. it. just didn't make any sense. Who was it? I mean, this this is a crime that 
never would have existed 20 or 30 years ago. It's it's mind boggling just the level of uh, to think just the engagement in victimhood to think that being a victim of a hate crime you'll get sympathy sure but to think that it would produce professional success is just crazy it's hard for me to think of it's elevating victimhood to a new level yeah i think <clears throat> whether people are doing it knowing this but there's kind of a currency or a value in being a victim in today's day and age would, would yes. you agree yes um it's not universal but there certainly is a value to showing that you have survived hardship, that you have overcome adversity. That can go often garner sympathy. People like those stories. Yeah, and I mean, especially, I mean, it was talked about on mainstream news outlets right away. I mean, you had presidential candidates tweeting about it. I mean, if, if he had gotten away with it, I mean, this puts his name into mainstream culture. I don't, I don't know what word you want to use, but I, I mean, I'd never heard of him until then. No, but to, uh, he is a star of a popular TV show. To, so in most respects, that counts as a celebrity. We're just not the people who watch a show. I'd never seen it. I'd never heard of it, but there's so many shows on. Yeah. What makes me really angry about this is the fact that it will what it does for people who are actually victims of hate crimes. This kind of thing raises, will raise the specter of doubt that when hate crimes occur, that they're fake, and that's terrible. Now, should there be some doubt because hate crimes can be faked? I mean, anything can be faked. I would argue historically that the majority of them have not been faked. I mean, look at this awful history of lynching in this country. Yeah. Uh, we could argue, I think it's a separate question, whether hate crimes should confer an additional criminal penalty or not. Uh, that's, let's put that aside for now. But yeah, there's a huge, mm -hmm. there's a huge history of hate crimes in America. Well, that's actually what I was going to ask you next yeah. is the idea of a hate crime. You know, if somebody assaults or does something bad to somebody, because they're a certain race, gender, uh, religion, whatever it is, does it should they be punished more for their motivations? I'm like, not, does that yeah. add to the punishment, or is it okay? You assaulted someone; it doesn't matter the reasoning. Yeah. Assault gets this punishment. I'm not a huge fan of hate crime laws. I mean, I think the assault should just be punished as assaults. But I understand the logic at the same point. We have a belief in America that people are equal. We're good at, in a lot of ways at tolerance. We have a diverse society. So when someone offends that ideal, that's upsetting to us. Right? It's, yeah. it's upsetting to us in a way a non, just an ordinary assault isn't. In some respects, so I understand the, I understand the rationale for it, but at the same time, if I'm, I don't know if I'm, be, if I'm, should happen to beat you up and I yell, "You fucking honky," should I be punished more severely? Is there I'm, any, is there anybody who's been charged with a hate crime when they attacked a white person? I would assume so. It certainly happened. It certainly happened. I would. I don't know for sure. I don't, sure, I don't know this history. So I'm, you know, I sorry, I don't have a a, a firm answer on that because. No, it's okay. Yeah. That's what this podcast yeah, is about. I see. Talking. I see. I see both sides here. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I don't want to get make the whole podcast about this. Just wanted to hear your thoughts and yeah. stuff. I mean, it's it's awful. Any assault yeah. is awful, and it's awful when people are targeted for who they are, especially for their the traits they were born with. It's it's, it's un-American. Yeah, it's, how, it's how do you feel about people on the left side of politics who are in the media um, jumping on stories like these and kind of 
It's kind of like uh, like people are like, see, see, this like this confirms my beliefs on the state of the country, of politics, of people I disagree with. Do you think some people are kind of too quick to use a, a crime or a, something that happened to push their beliefs or agenda? I don't think this is a good example of that uh, because just historically in America, most of the time, what appears to be a hate crime was a hate crime. The number of... Certainly, there are some well-known faked incidents, instances like Jesse Smollett, but there are many more instances that are, that are real. So I don't think it's also something that is the political left is especially prone to do. Both sides do that. After all, we just had back in November, October, November, at right before the election, we had both the synagogue shooting and the bombs mailed to Clinton and Joe Biden and a bunch of other prominent Democrats. Yeah. And in fact, uh, since 9-11, the majority of deaths identified as, uh, or murders identified as terrorism have been right, terrorists from right-leaning people. It sucks the crazy people got to ruin it. Yeah, <laughs> or, totally. For everybody else. <laughs> totally. Um, totally. Okay. Well, I su yeah, I support people's right to have political beliefs that aren't mine, of course, but not when they, not when they're expressed in violence. Hmm. Okay. Now, moving on. Yeah. Uh, Democratic presidential candidates. Who do you whoa. like? Whoa. <laughs> what? What do you mean, whoa? <laughs> There's so many of them. And I it's, know. It's so it's so soon. I know. But Bernie announced, do you think Hillary's going to run? Oh, God, I hope not. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> it's not nothing. Uh, it wasn't even anti-Hillary. They said that it's just that we've had enough of her. In 2016, Barbara Bush, or 15, said, said publicly, you know, I hope Jeb doesn't run. The country has had enough of Bushes and Clintons. Let someone else do it. Seriously, we don't need family dynasties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I hope she doesn't, but it's a wide open field. I can tell you uh, who I like least. Let's hear it. Uh, Kristen Gillibrand, the New York senator, who's done a lot of demagoguing on Title IX, uh, who's really done activism where the whole point of the activism is that people accused of sexual misconduct aren't, don't deserve due process. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. Because <laughs> that, would you say that kind of tends to bleed into other issues? Like maybe her lack of critical thinking of that particular issue might be the same in other areas? I think there was, this, there was a calculated decision of hers to seize on this issue but that's enough to make me find her morally compromised. She also changed all of her positions in about two years. She was a Democratic congressman by elected in a conservative upstate district. So she was a very centrist Democrat. She had a really good NRA score, the whole nine yards, and then was appointed to the Senate to replace, I think, Hillary when Hillary became Secretary of State. And all of a sudden, representing the whole state, she changed all of her positions overnight and became more liberal. Uh, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> no. <laughs> she, she stuck her finger in the air and found out which way the wind was blowing. I don't like, uh, what's her name, the congressman from uh, Hawaii, the, you know, the young... Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah, Tulsi Gabbard. Really? You don't like her? I mean... <sighs> It's she's a flake. She has such a weird constellation of positions, also some of which changed really rapidly. So she was spearheading a, a few years ago an anti-gay marriage uh, project in Hawaii. See, I heard something about yeah. that. Wasn't 
that with her father, but yes. she's now since disavowed. Yeah, just dis- now like... I totally respect people's changing some positions, as I've quoted uh, the great British economist John Maynard Keynes. He says, "When the facts change, I I change my mind." What do you do, sir? I just quoted that on the show before. So certainly people can change, but she has a a strange collection of beliefs. She's done a lot of weird apologizing for the murderous Assad regime in in Syria. Hmm. Uh, she has, uh, you know, she's been a member of a strange religious sect for a long time. I've heard a little bit about that, but I yeah. I don't know the details, so I can't really comment. I do know she's very anti-war. Yeah. Is that correct? That yeah, and that's nothing. So. You, I think it's good to be cautious about committing American troops, putting them in harm's way. But yeah, there's uh, it's why do cons- why do far right people love her so much? I uh, I didn't know far far right people. They love do. Her. Like Cernovich is always going on and on about her. It's they have a really weird fixation with her. Hmm. Maybe it's the anti-war sentiments. Uh, I don't know. I don't Maybe. know too much about her. I've Maybe. I've heard her on Joe Rogan's podcast, yeah. but I listen yeah. to so many podcasts, hard to remember yeah. what she says. So you know, I don't I don't know too much about her. And she's she's young and she doesn't have much experience, just a few terms in Congress. But anyhow, she has she's taken especially in Syria and foreign affairs, she's taken some positions that are hard to hard to deal with that are just, anyhow. Uh I think my senator, Kamala Harris, who is running as a more serious candidate. But, okay. yeah, uh, yeah, she seems to be one of the top people I hear being is. talked about. She Cory is. Booker, Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders. So there are a couple of things that, with Kamala Harris that make me uncomfortable. There's some I like. I like her plan for greatly expanded earned income tax credit. I think that's great. She didn't ha- She was a former prosecutor where she did not have a particularly progressive record. In how she, how she pursued criminal, uh, in how she prosecuted people, she's also taken a position on civil rights. Strangely, that I, I'm uncomfortable with. She said, civil rights is a matter of national security. What does that mean? <laughs> well, what it means is, it's. I think it's great she's committed to civil rights. I think that part is fantastic. But when you make it a part of national security, that's sort of like saying you can't criticize it, right? She's saying that America, it will threaten our very nation as a country. That's almost like, I'm not. I'm not putting it in. I'm not putting it in, articulating it in clearly. But that's almost putting it, elevating it to a position where you can't question how she's supporting it because if you question it, you hate America. Yeah, it's yeah, like it's, the Patriot Act. <laughs> yeah, it's... it's uh, there's, so there's an article I read. I can look it up. I'll recommend it, which made this point, which made this point much in a much more articulate way than I am. It just speaks to a troubling trend of making everything a question of national security. And we don't want a militarized society. We don't want a society where you can't question. We can't question anything because if you do, it makes you sound like you, you're unpatriotic. Yeah, so, I, I, I hate that thinking. <laughs> so that's sort of the thing. You know, don't get me wrong. I think a, a commitment to civil rights is great, and I applaud anyone who appeals to that tradition but the way she has phrased this makes me a little uncomfortable i like elizabeth harris elizabeth warren i'm sorry a lot more has she officially uh declared her run for president she has a while ago so now i know you hate talking about the native american thing because it doesn't have anything to do with policies and philosophy on issues and stuff like that but 
I, I don't know how you can argue against that the election of a president is now based – it's basically a popularity contest. Has it ever not been a popularity contest under those terms? No, but that's kind of my point or, – or that kind of ties into my point is, is this going to affect her popularity? I don't know. I mean Donald Trump basically won the election – on not being very specific on any policies. <laughs> very unspecific yes. about policies. Yes. So, and I think if you're coming from the Democratic side of politics, yeah. the number one question is, who's going to beat Donald Trump? Because I haven't really heard anything about Republicans running and Republicans being angry, saying, I'm going to beat Donald Trump. And S- Some have talked. There's some, some rumors that some may try to challenge him in a primary. I mean, they're going to try, but, I mean, I can't imagine anybody beating him. They didn't beat him last time when he was a nobody when it comes to politics. So, I I mean, I feel like it's safe to assume he's going to be the Republican nominee. Or... I think that's safe to assume. There's only a couple of times in recent history when someone has attempted a primary challenge. So... Uh, Teddy Kennedy attempted to deny Jimmy Carter the nomination in 1980. He failed. In 1976, Ronald Reagan tried to take the nomination from Gerald Ford. He failed. Those are the only part, intra-party primary challengers to incumbent presidents I can think of in recent years. So it's generally accepted if a president is running for a second term, everybody on that party kind of backs off as far as running. Yes. Although, you know, Trump is a unique president and yes. <laughs> uniquely unpopular. So there, you know, there's some, some murmuring that he might get challenged. So for example, much to many people's surprise, both Massachusetts and Maryland, both very democratic states have widely, po- wildly popular Republican governors. Hmm. And they have those governors are popular because they are far from the, what where the National Republican Party stands. So these are Republican governors concerned with climate change who dislike Trump. And the governor of Maryland said he won't rule out running in a statement just a couple of days ago. But whether that would go anywhere, who knows? Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people don't like Trump, but I feel like you have to admit there's a lot of people that really do like him. I mean, he fills, like, stadiums with his rallies. He Yes, he has a very stable Republican base. Yeah, and I feel like it would be very hard to sway that base becoming yes. a, for a different Republican to step in. So, yes. safe to say he's going to be the Republican nominee yes. unless something crazy happens. So who can beat him if you're coming from the Democratic side? Le- legitimately, who who can stand toe to toe with him and debate and beat his style? Because right. his style of debating isn't good in terms of being detailed and you know in the ways that me and you would like to hear a debate happen. But as far as becoming popular, it's really hard to know ahead of time. Certainly in retrospect. It looks if the election, the 2016 election, were decided was decided in large part by Rust Belt voters who voted for Obama in 2012 and then turned around and voted for Trump. So people in Wisconsin and states like that, if those are the deciding people were the deciding factor, certainly it looks like Bernie would have done better among those people. Ahead of time, you think, you know, the whole socialist business is just going to, you know, make make it so he can't win. Do you think so? You think his, uh, a lot of people tie the term socialist to Bernie. Do you think that will hurt Bernie? No longer. I think Republicans did it to themselves by screaming about how every democratic policy was socialism and if we have Social Security in two days later, we're going to have Stalinist death camps. I mean, that's really, that's been the Republican line for decades. 
in the early 1960s, Ronald Reagan was saying that Medicare, you know, health care for all the elderly was one step down the road to socialism and becoming the Soviet Union. No, I think they just oversold those claims too much. Hmm. So I, that's why I think just saying social, just the word socialism doesn't have the same baggage to a lot of young people. I think a lot of young people, whether they really know what that means or not, yeah. but they, they want socialism. They yeah. like that. That word is a positive to yeah. them. But I think that word means Scandinavian capitalism, right? Capitalism with a broader safety net. I don't even think they go that deep. I think they just like think free college and healthcare <laughs> and good, just good stuff. Like <laughs> right, so I think right, right. a lot of young people that they're just good stuff and right. that's cheap <laughs> and <laughs> will help us and fuck yeah. rich people. <laughs> I think I think that type of thinking is growing in America. I mean, <laughs> I know Twitter's not the best gauge of how people are thinking, yeah. but I'm seeing a lot of people comment in ways that they are very anti capitalism, pro socialism. And I don't want to get, like, alarmist about, like, there's people commenting on Twitter, so therefore that's how people feel. But I don't know. I'm, it, not, I'm, not worried about, I'm not worried about the failure of American capitalism because of a few extremists on Twitter. No, no, I'm not worried at all. Yeah. But I, I do yeah. think it, it is growing. Yeah. It, oh, yeah, there's, least, yeah, there's clear survey evidence that socialism is more popular. And again, I blame in part Republicans for you know, stoking fears that anything program like Social Security or a minimum wage is going to put a mean two days later, the government seizing your property and throwing you in a camp. Yeah, see, I don't even think Rep like Republic some Republicans may talk like that, but you know, they're not re doing anything legitimately to end those things. I mean, has there been any legitimate legislation or movement to end oh yes those things oh yes Recent, recently oh yes look how hard the republicans tried to destroy obamacare in 2005 after bush won his second term he had a whole plan to partially privatize social security and it, that was so unpopular that he had to retreat Hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. There's been all sorts of talk about Paul Ryan was always trying to talk about taking, you know, reducing Medicare funding by turning it into a block grant rather than the single payer system it is. So, yeah, there's absolutely been all sorts of movement. Mm -hmm. I it's I'm simplifying a little because on the other hand. George W. Bush did it span Medicare and did it span food stamps. So he kind of did both. Of, yes. Like expanding it, but the end, but trying the, to uh, decrease it in some ways. Yes, but the the attack on Obamacare was as soon as Trump came into office was ferocious, and it was. Um, it was in bad faith because they talked. Remember Trump saying, we're going to get rid of Obamacare and everyone's going to have insurance that'll be better and cheaper. And Republicans had years to work on a plan. And then when it came time to end Obamacare, they really didn't have a plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, to bring up Ben Shapiro again, he was on Joe Rogan's podcast. Uh, I think maybe right before Trump got elected, maybe right after. And he's like, yeah, all these politicians say, like, we're going to go in there and we're going to repeal Obamacare and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And he's like, you're not. You're, you're, you're not. Like, let's be real. You're, you're not going to do any of that. You know, like this, the way our government works is it's a pretty slow, creeping crawl. He's right and, about that. Yeah, and he's like, and, and to be honest, he's like, I kind of like the gridlock because if you had wild swings in government policy every four years, like it would be kind of chaos. Well, a gridlock Congress means a stronger executive, or in theory, a stronger executive. And that's, I don't think, what the framers of the Constitution had in mind. They really had in mind three equal, co-equal branches of government. And Congress has done so little.
But anyhow, getting let me get back to Elizabeth Warren. Okay. I like that she has very specific, detailed, progressive proposals. She was a college professor for a long time. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, created in 2010 in response to the financial crisis, was her product. She brought that into the world and to attempt to limit the extent to which mortgage companies could lie when selling people shitty mortgages that would explode a couple of years later. That very much impressed me. She has a very detailed proposal to expand Head Start and provide you know, close to universal subsidized child care. Now that all sounds great. Yeah, And but... she has plans to pay for it. Oh, that's even better. Yeah. <laughs> Now, when she's on the debate stage with Trump, yeah. how, how's that going to go down? That, to me, that's <laughs> right. the number one thing. If, right. if, you're, if you're a Democrat, yeah. who can stand there with Trump? I mean, he's going to call her Pocahontas. He's right. going to he, he's going to say stuff that most politicians have never experienced, yeah. and I feel like that's the biggest part of why he won. I, you know, I didn't follow the election closely as it was happening. I, I just thought. I wasn't as interested in politics at that time. As the older the older I get, the more I'm interested. Same here. But as I rewatch debates and stuff like that, yeah, I think the most appealing thing about Trump was he talked like most Americans. He t it was like off the cuff and it was braggadocious. It was shit talking. It was yeah. I think a lot of blue collar Americans related to the way he talked. I think and, you're right. And how is I don't know how is she going to fare I don't yeah. know that's such an that is such a unprecedented task in American politics it's hard to know how different candidates would fare against him no yeah. to me the biggest thing is how is the economy going to be when the election is coming to a close because he uh, I've heard many times on a podcast I like to listen yeah. to is Trump's making a mistake of saying the economy is so good because of him. So now <laughs> if the economy yeah. has a downturn, yeah. then it's like, well, then it's your fault because you said all this good stuff was happening because of you. So if bad stuff happens, then it must be because of you, right? I mean, economics traditionally ha play a huge part in who wins presidential elections. In 1991, George H.W. Bush had just successfully waged the desert storm. He had 90% approval ratings, unheard of today. A year later, we were in a session and he lost. The economy had just picked up in 1984 when Reagan was reelected. The economy was doing well in 1996 when Clinton was reelected. So the economy matters a, a huge deal. That having been said, with mostly strong economic numbers, Trump suffered a, a historic defeat in the midterms. Hmm. That's a good point. Now, are, is the economy better? Well, the market is way up. That's great. Unemployment is low. Wages have not grown. Hmm. So it's it's mixed. Yeah. So, But if Trump still has... Those talking points of lowest unemployment, black unemployment, that, that's a it helps. stat it helps. that loves to get thrown around by conservatives. It helps, although you know, blacks are not voting for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm I mean, proud. some tiny percent will vote. A, a slightly larger percent of Latinos will vote, right? but those numbers are small. Yeah. What do you think – so the biggest thing he was running on was the wall and immigration. Which, right. which they, so what's, what do you think his main point <laughs> is going to be this time? Well, he has a couple of options. I think what's going to happen is his state of emergency and funds are going to be tied up in court forever. Among the people who oh, – a number of states' attorneys general have just filed suit against the federal government to block the state of emergency wall – Suits have been suits has been joined by the ACLU, by the Texas Land, uh, Association of Texas Landholders, you know, who don't want that, you know, who are probably Republicans. What's going to happen? Trump can probably, you know, he won't have his wall covering or plans for the, his big wall, but he already has funds. He can build slightly smaller sections of wall. He could just do that and declare victory. 
Yeah, he's gonna post pictures of like, look, he already has, yeah, but yeah. like, look, we're building, we're doing it, right? And I, I, <laughs> I feel like that's the problem with a lot of politics and like elections is you don't need to be super detailed and uh, thorough with your positions and stuff you say. I mean, I feel like this whole Trump thing is like a perfect example of if you say the right things, then people are like, it's good. We're good with – we'll go with him. That, does, that, does that worry you at all? Yes, it, it frustrates me. That people aren't digging deeper into what politicians are promising, what's the, realistic, the, They're really what's not. not. Now, now America is so polarized, it's about supporting your team. And in presidential elections and campaigning, it's not about convincing undecided voters to vote for you. It's more about getting your team to vote. Yeah. Right. Hillary, a lot of Democrats stayed home because Hillary didn't excite them. It wasn't a question of getting, for the most part, of getting undecided people to vote. If you phone bank, if you call, make phone calls just to volunteer for a campaign, you're not trying to argue one side over the other. You're, you're just trying to get your people to vote. Yeah. Do you think a lot of people didn't vote because they thought it was a done deal? That's possible. I think... Uh, Certainly the fact that just a few days before the election, Comey said he was reopening the whole email investigation. Do you think that really hurt her? Oh, yeah, there? yeah. I, there were slumping poll numbers after that. But the whole Trump grabbed by the pussy didn't, like, did that affect it that much? Because when I saw that, I, thought, I was like, oh, he's done for yeah, sure. Yeah, I, th I thought that too. But that same day, WikiLeaks released a whole tranche of, of emails, right, that helped take some of the heat off Trump. Hmm. Literally that same day as the pussy grabbing clip came out. Okay. Anyhow, Elizabeth Warren has very detailed progressive proposals that I like, as well as a mechanism for paying for them. Her mechanism is not a higher marginal tax rate, but a tax on wealth. Wealth of over fifty million dollars a year. Um, I hate taxes, but <laughs> so yeah, I, I know, I that. know. But I do appreciate that she actually has a plan for it. Instead yes, of just laying out an idea. Yeah, I. So yeah, that, that brings me to the new, the Green New Deal. So have there, you looked into that at all? A little bit. It's. It's not really a plan so much as an aspirational statement. It's great. I mean, the idea that we should reduce our carbon footprint is vitally important. I think it's so. I think we should be looking at ways of doing that. Do you think that's just naturally happening with the market? I mean, I'm seeing yeah. I know that's such a small, minute example. It's non-scientific, but I'm seeing Teslas driving around everywhere. It is happening slowly. I mean, we essentially are pricing out coal, but it should happen faster. I, now, the, um, one thing it does not include is an idea that's gotten a lot of bipartisan support, and that's having a carbon tax or cap and trade, where if companies want to produce a lot of carbon, they have to pay, they have to pay for the right to produce carbon. That system worked very well uh, uh, about 30 years ago there was a thing called acid rain yeah and a cap and trade system was successful there so that's been an idea that's uh and a number of uh republic uh former republican secretaries of state people like george schultz you know elders of the party support a carbon tax and that's not in the green new deal another i think important mechanism for getting there is more nuclear power a lot of people i i could be wrong but i i swear i heard the the new green deal is against nuclear power that's counterproductive i mean that's there's a widespread discomfort with nuclear power on the left and i think we should the left should get over that because it is so it produces you know it's so carbon neutral yeah, it's very efficient. It's one problem why we haven't built nuclear power plants is they're expensive to build. And, and the the worry if something happens. I don't. Uh, 
It's very rare, I know that. It is. But, it is. but that's is is that the worry that yes. you know, what if something happens? Yes. But contrast that to all the people in West Virginia choking to death on coal dust and run, yeah. you know, and all the po- yeah. poisonous runoff uh, from slurry piles running off into water. The other thing I would caution about the Green New Deal is it's coupling an environmental program with an economic program, and I think those things are better separate. Okay, can you elaborate on that? Sure. So there's uh, some version of the of a federal jobs guarantee in the Green New Deal, and uh, it's the connection between uh, reducing our carbon footprint I, and more more social programs and more government spending. I think it's better. To, I think it's better to tr- take them separately. I do think that some, you know, there is some natural connection. If the government spends money to reduce our carbon, that will create our carbon footprint. That will create jobs. But should reducing our carbon footprint be linked to a federal jobs guarantee? Yeah, that's kind of a it, weird. It's a big. It's a big. Connection. So it's a. It's the Green New Deal is not is not. A bit, you know, it's not so much a bill as just a, a vision statement. And a lot of what's in the vision statement, I think, is great, but we need to talk about how to get there in more concrete terms. Now, according to Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, yes. the world is going to end in 12 years if we don't <laughs> she, do anything. She literally <laughs> said that. I okay. watched the video. Right. She said that. I'm not a scientist. I'm not good at evaluating the science i think that and these forecasting predicting shit that's going to happen in the in the future is always difficult but i have no doubt in my mind that bad shit will happen as the world's temperature uh continue to 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 go up i just don't know how long it will take i think we need to do much more rooster coming footprint but it's i mean this is why this is why it's been hard to sell to sell um, Americans on the climate crisis. You just say, well, this is down the road sometime. That's, a, that's tough to get people concerned when they're more concerned about their jobs than their health care. Do you feel like that allowing the market to develop and just like Tesla is a perfect example, I, I feel like, especially as people become more aware, but naturally – just the way things are going, we will reduce our carbon output and all those things. Just uh, like electricity and clean energy will become more efficient and naturally we'll just head that direction. I think we need to harness market forces to get there, like through a cap and trade system or carbon offsets. But no, that's an area of innovation where the market doesn't do very well. Because think of, so we're, what's the... the the market for energy it's a lot of it is these legacy companies like the uh, gas like gas companies or oil companies and so their their impetus is not to create new energy technologies but just to extract petroleum more efficiently and find more of it but if those comp- those same companies could evolve and realize if I mean, it all comes down to money. So if they yes. could go, hey, yeah. hey, we can make just as much money with solar panels or whatever technology. This uh, is really an area where government investments in research is necessary. Tesla does get a lot of government, I don't know if it's subsidies or tax credit, but uh, I have read and heard that Tesla cars would cost a lot more if it wasn't for the government. I believe it. I mean, I got solar panels in my house two years ago, and I got a big federal tax credit for doing it. Uh, But I'm talking not about just... And, of course, I was buying them from a private company, so it was creating economic activity. But I'm talking especially about research. There we really need government involvement. I mean, think about how many inventions, things we take, for day-to-day use did not come from the private sector came from government investment yeah yeah i mean as as a libertarian i i can't deny what you're saying yeah i mean 
GPS. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I don't know if I can come up with enough of them in the short term to impress you or not, but the, you know, the internet, GPS, Kevlar, so many things, compute, you know, a lot of computers. <laughs> yeah. I love how you included Kevlar in that list. <laughs> well, it's it's important. It's true. It, sa- it's it, saves, true. it saves lives. It does. <laughs> I, I should have a bigger list, but the list. I know. Yeah. But I know what you're yeah. saying. And <laughs> even if you want to retreat to libertarianism, there other countries invest a lot more in research and development. So this money is ultimately is competing with other company, countries and will ultimately end up in things, you know, will ultimately end up in creating market activity. It's just the market needs a little push. Mm. Okay. I can appreciate that perspective. The evolution in solar panels over the last 10 years has been astonishing. You know, they were yeah. not particularly commercially viable 10 years ago. They just didn't produce the next, a lot of electricity. Now they do. Yeah. I have read some things about um, like old green energy products becoming a huge liability and waste, like the old solar panels. <laughs> like, like, what are we going to do with those now that the new ones are here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Better? yeah. Like the ones my dad got in the late 70s. Yeah, those yeah. things are a bunch of bullshit oh, <laughs> compared, yeah. compared mean, to now. He got it because the the Carter government created a tax incentive and all it would do was produce some of the hot water the house needed. Not all of it, some of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess we'll transition to a less serious topic. Uh, Nick, who's the best fighter of all time? And by best fighter, you mean best mixed martial arts fighter, not just best anything fighter? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, fighter is MMA. If you want to talk about any other martial art, you're a boxer or kickboxer. I mean, it still is fighting in a way, but yeah. I think for people like us, you say who's the best fighter. It's yeah. All about, it's all about MMA. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to be technical and precise because if we included boxers, we'd have some names. If we included re- uh, wrestlers, we'd have more names. So we're sticking to mixed martial arts. Yeah. And I think there's usually... F- Four serious contenders in this argument: George St. Pierre, GSP, otherwise known as GSP, Anderson Silva, uh, Fedor Emelianenko, and John Jones. Anyone no. who stands uh, out, and probably pretty soon we'll add Khabib Nurmagomedov to that list, but not quite yet. Yeah, to me, to be considered the greatest, I think you kind of have to be at the at least end of your career or your career having. You have to be retired, I think, to be totally in consideration. You can be considered one of the greatest, or but for me, you know, like John Jones, it's really tough to argue he's not the deadliest fighter to ever walk the face of the earth. I mean, I, I haven't. I mean, there hasn't been anybody that's really challenged him significantly. He had a pretty close fight fight with Gustafson the first time, but. You know, he did win, and then the second time they fought, he, he demolished him. Yeah. But for me, there, there is a slight difference between the greatest fighter and the greatest martial artist. And I think George St. Pierre is the greatest martial artist of all time because he could do everything. He really didn't have a weakness. He had th- certain things that he was better at than others, but I don't think there's an aspect to his game that he was weak in. That's true. He could wrestle really well. He had pretty good jujitsu. He had decent striking. Could certainly yeah. make that argument. And he had a uh, uh, good uh, uh, fight, a uh, high fight IQ. He, yeah. he knew to box against the good grapplers he faced, like Jake Shields, and to grapple the, the good strikers he faced. Yeah, and he also carried himself so well. Yes. You know, never had any controversies. Didn't talk a bunch of shit. Wasn't disrespectful. He, he's just the perfect example of a martial artist. Yeah, stand-up human being. Although he did say of Matt Hughes, "I am not impressed with your performance." Um, I am not impressed with. Unfor- yeah, he he did. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> he did a little bit of that stuff. 
certainly if you're talking about quality of human being, you would exclude John Jones from the conversation. I don't see why it's we have to exclude people who are still fighting. That suggests they'll do something later on that will diminish their record. You know, they'll fight too long when they're past the peak of their abilities, or they'll, you know, get into trouble for steroids or something. Well, okay, I guess we could talk about that. Do uh, steroids come into play with um, how we view the greatest fighter? Because I was looking at some older pictures of GSP, and the way his traps and arms looked are a little suspicious. I mean, he was jacked when he was younger. He was shredded, and he's still shredded now. But it was a it was a different thing. But he's never failed a test. So that's true. And he walked away from the sport you have to get, at one point for several years because he was concerned about the lack of testing. Yeah, and if I if I remember correctly, I do believe he was still in the USADA testing pool that whole time, like when it was implemented. Even though he wasn't fighting, he was getting tested. That was my understanding too. Yeah, never had an issue. You know, John Jones has had multiple, multiple issues with that stuff. Uh, Anderson Silva has had issues with that stuff. I think True. Even though there's no evidence, probably fairly safe to say Fedor, a Russian fighter in pride. <laughs> right. <laughs> Odds are. He, he didn't piss them. hot just because he wasn't tested for most of his career. Yeah. So. Well, certainly on those criteria, we can uh, call GSP the best. He didn't always have the most exciting performances or or scintillating knockouts or submissions but uh but to me it's not yeah. it's not always about the excitement people bring that up but it's like you know it's mixed martial arts it's about defense it's about you know subduing an opponent and not taking damage yes and and so you could be like a Vanderlei Silva type where you have a bunch of knockouts and you go in there and you're just wild and crazy and super entertaining, but from a martial arts standpoint, that's not the smartest way to fight. And, Agreed. And I think and I think GSP fought the smartest way. Agreed. Although, if we're just talking about who the best martial artist of all times is, I think we'd have to uh, talk include Bruce Lee in that conversation. Nah, he never fought. <laughs> he never fought. I've never seen him shoot a takedown, so... Just because he t- watch watch Enter the Dragon. He's arm barring guys. That's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I would whoop Bruce Lee's ass. I'm saying it right now. <laughs> I got a hundred pounds on the guy, but I'd still whoop his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Those are fighting words for someone. Uh, well, if they fight like Bruce Lee, I'm not scared. <laughs> uh, huh. I would. I mean, he was. Interested in the best fighting style, he was a fairly unique physical and athletic specimen. I wouldn't want to fight him. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a good guy, and I wouldn't wouldn't want to fight him really. But I'm more just talking shit and being funny, but or attempting and, to be funny. <laughs> and he's dead. And he's dead. So rest in peace, Bruce Lee. Yes. Appreciate what you did. Yep. But you're an actor. <laughs> <laughs> well, fighters make movies. But they're fighters first. I, I think I've he was seen, a fi- he was a fighter before he was making movies. I've seen zero evidence of him actually fighting. So until then, there's until vid- I, there's video yeah. of him competing in what counted as uh, fights of the day, competing in tournaments. There's maybe one video. Go on, you, go on YouTube. Uh, I can I I have, but. <sighs> I'm skeptical, especially the quality of opponents he was facing and the rule sets they had. But all respect to Bruce Lee, but and all an, am- an amateur MMA fighter today would whoop his ass. I'll agree that the rule sets were not optimal for testing his true abilities. Yeah. So what about Daniel Cormier? I mean, the only guy he's lost to ever is... John Jones. John Jones had has had positive ster- multiple positive steroid tests. How do you feel about some people call Daniel, especially when he won beat Stipe? A lot of people were calling Daniel Cormier the greatest of all time. I think it's hard to call him the greatest of all time with John Jones still hanging over him. 
Yeah, it, it is tough. Yeah. But man, you got to give credit to Daniel. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> that dude is such a beast. Yeah, and he's a he, stand-up human being too. Yeah, he really doesn't give an, get enough credit because it because of the whole John Jones things, but man, talk about a dude who definitely looks like he's not on steroids. <laughs> Has been getting tested for over a decade. I, he broke it down one day. He says he's like the most tested athlete by USADA, maybe combat athlete. But he's been getting tested since he's in the Olympics, MMA, and then USADA with the UFC. I mean, if you can make a case for anybody for for sure being clean, it's that guy. I agree. I agree. And he's like five foot ten. <laughs> he looks like middle America dad. Yep. Well, thank you for listening. Well, one last thing. What, so, okay. do you have a definitive best greatest of all time? I could certainly see a strong case for GSP, but I think uh, these lists are, are speculative in a lot of ways. It's comparing apples and oranges, different weight classes, fighting in different eras, in different rule under different rule sets. So I think there's some folly in deciding who the real greatest of all time is. Yeah, and even GSP said on Joe Rogan's podcast, there's no, there is no greatest because anybody can be beat on any given day, and you could beat a guy. And that guy could beat the guy who beat you, and you're almost never going to find out. That That is true. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Hope you enjoyed this episode of me and Nick just talking shit. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Remember, if you like what you heard, go give us a good rating. Because we need your money to drive our media empire. <laughs> the more money, the better. Thank you. <laughs>